Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming this afternoon, and thank you to our candidates for council, for mayor, and for the Lynn County judgeships for coming and um, letting us listen to you and your points of view. My name is Helen Nelson. I am the chair of the um, government um, committee for the Lebanon Chamber of Commerce this year. Um, Charlie Eads, local businessman and KGALKSHO, I've got to get the initials right. Um, show, radio show is here to moderate tonight. Um, I'm going to start by asking everybody to silence their phones, please. And then the other thing that I have to tell you is where the bathrooms are, because that's very important. So out to the right and to the right again, and then on the left, bathrooms. Um, and I think. Pads and pens. Oh, pads and pens. The radio. The um, show has very kindly donated pads and pens out there for everybody's use. Um, we are going to be asking certain set questions, but you will also have the opportunity to ask your own questions. So if you hear things and if things come up as we're going through, uh, write it down and we will ask you your own questions later. So I am now going to turn this over to Charlie and uh, we'll get started. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ellen. I'm going to take the mic away. Good evening, everyone. It's hot up here under the lights. Uh, we have our city council candidates all lined up, and we pre-drew the names, the order that they will introduce themselves, and uh, also answer the first question, and then we'll reverse that order when we go back. Um, my, the candidates will have only one and a half minutes and you guys have been pre-warned about this, right? You were, they were given this rather involved question, and they got one and a half minutes to answer it. So that's a challenge in itself. So the order that we have, make sure I cover everything here. If you do have questions, you've got pads and pens, go ahead and jot them down. Shelley or somebody will be gathering those up and passing them up to me. The first question goes to Dustin Denver. Who happens to be right here. Oh, we got self-introductions first. I'm sorry. Thanks, Helen, for reminding me. And that will also be in that order. Go, Dustin. Oh, so we, here you go. Thank you. Yeah. So everybody introduces, and then we go through the questions? Well, we're going to go. I'll introduce the next person. We're okay. going to go in this order. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody, for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Dustin Denver, and I'm hoping you'll provide me with the opportunity to be your next Lebanon City Council member for Ward 3. Uh, many of you know me from my many years of involvement with the city as a business owner and through AYSO Soccer, uh, the Lebanon Rotary Club, the Boys and Girls Club, helping out at the schools, uh, my time on the Planning Commission, or when I worked as an IT analyst for the City of Lebanon. Uh, for those of you that I haven't met yet, I'll uh, tell you a little bit about myself. I was born and grew up here in Lebanon. Graduated as the last class of Lebanon Union High School. And uh, as a business owner here in town, through a public-private partnership with the city, I helped to build out the Lebanon City Wi-Fi system. And as a volunteer with AYSO, again, utilizing public and private partnerships, I helped facilitate and develop the soccer fields out at Cheetah Lake. Now I want to continue my commitment to the Lebanon community as part of the city council. Thank you. Thank you, Dustin. Wayne Reiskamp is up next. Wayne, take it away. Charlie, that's pronounced Reiskamp. Okay, we'll, we'll call him by whatever. Wayne Reiskamp is up. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Wayne Reiskamp, and it's my privilege to have served as a city councillor four terms already, and so I'm running unopposed for my fifth term. I really enjoy doing the council city business for the citizens of Lebanon. Um, my wife and I moved here in 1969 from Redmond, Oregon. Uh, I've served on about every committee in Lebanon that can, you can serve on, but uh, currently I am the director of operations at Cheadle Park. I, of course, sit on city council. I'm an elder at my church, and it's a pleasure to each month make decisions based on what we as a council feel is best for this community. And that really does a lot in 
determining my pleasure in running for this position again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wayne. Right next to you, Karen Stoddard is up next. Karen? Good evening. I'm kind of shy and don't have a very loud voice. My name is Karen Stouter, and I actually moved to this great state in 1986. I came here just to come to college and get the heck out of Dodge, because Corvallis is really, really small, and I couldn't imagine uh, staying. And it's now 2018, and here I am. Uh, since moving, I uh, graduated college with a law enforcement degree and a, a minor in computer science. I was very lucky to get hired on with the Corrales Police Department, and I have just served 25 years, and at the end of January, I got to retire. And uh, <laughs> I'm enjoying that a lot. Uh, I do work part-time at the police academy, so I do like to do instruction. Unlike my opponents, actually, I'm running unopposed in Ward 2, uh, but I still think that I should not just expect that I get voted in. Um, I still have to earn people's trust. And I don't have a lot of experience in serving time here in the city, but I tell you, I have been... <laughs> Thanks, Karen. Next up is Michelle Steinhebel. Michelle, pass her the mic. Hello, everybody. My name is Michelle Steinhebel. I'm running for Lebanon City Council Ward 3. Um, a couple years ago, I was fortunate enough to serve on the Lebanon 2040 Task Force, and that really um, heightened my interest in running for this position here today. Um, I'm from Lebanon. I graduated from Lebanon High School. I attended uh, LBCC and have my associates from LBCC, as well as my bachelor's degree in political science from Oregon State University. I'm currently the public affairs manager at Western University of Health Sciences, Comp Northwest, known in short as our medical school here in town. Prior to that, I was uh, the editor of the Lebanon Express, and prior to that, I was the editor of the Central Oregonian in Prineville. Um, I'm involved on the, I'm part of the Lebanon um, Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors, the Lebanon Schools Foundation, and, and I'm the incoming vice president for the Lebanon Optimist Club. Um, Looking forward to talking to everybody a little bit tonight. I have two children that I'm raising here in town with my husband John and our my mom also lives with us and Thank you <laughs> Thanks Michelle Greg you're next Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Greg Nervino. Uh, I'm a uh, 22 in uh, a few months a resident of uh, the city of Lebanon. Uh, I came here in 1995 uh, to work uh, with Consumers Power, uh, became locally involved as a volunteer, uh, served as the president of the Lebanon Optimist Club uh, two years. Uh, uh, I've served uh, president of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, board member of the Lebanon Community Foundation, uh, past chair of the uh, Lebanon Community Foundation. Uh, I served a five-year term uh, on that. Uh, was part of uh, the negotiating committee to uh, acquire Cheetah Lake. Uh, many years of uh, volunteerism uh, in the city, and I'd like to continue. Did I hear the bell? Just, just a word of advice, if you've got a few words left to say after the bell rings, you can finish your sentence. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Okay, these questions, uh, as I mentioned, these questions have been given uh, to the council candidates ahead of time. But I'm going to read them for the benefit of the audience. Question number one, and it goes in the same order, this is for Dustin first. Albany, Adair, and even Corvallis are seeing significant residential and commercial developments moving forward. But developing our prime commercial industrial land is not competitive in the market because of, ne because of necessary wetland mitigation. Residential development on the southwest end of town will require significant investment in the wastewater collection system. What should the city's role in financing these projects be? Another URD or something else or nothing? So the city's investment in infrastructure in the north part of town is what helped make the development of Lowe's, Comp Northwest, the Veterans Home, Boulder Falls, 
other small businesses and housing available in that part of town. The most significant areas that are available inside the urban growth boundary right now to be developed are in the west and south parts of town. Unfortunately, developments being discouraged in those areas due to a lack of infrastructure and wetlands issues. Uh, specifically, the West Side Interceptor wastewater collection line. The West Side Interceptor was a huge issue back in the early 2000s when I was on Planning Commission. Some progress has been made on that since then, but it's a critical piece of infrastructure that needs to be completed. I believe the city should be taking a proactive role in mitigating the wetlands issues and completing infrastructure in the southwest parts of town. City staff have taken a good step forward by hiring a firm to re-examine the area's wetlands, but money should be set aside every budget year for infrastructure improvements and to offer assistance to property owners for wetland mitigation. A URD would certainly help to make more funds available to complete these projects sooner, but in the meantime, we should be setting a higher priority in the budget for assistance with these issues. Then proactively reaching out to the county and the state seeking economic development money to help create shovel-ready sites. A plan needs to be developed for taking on these issues one small bite at a time over a long period while we continue to work on finding ways to fund these projects sooner. Thank you. Same question to Wayne. You know, the, the current city council uh, has uh, gave staff uh, the uh, direction to reach out with the League of Oregon Cities and the state of Oregon to look at litigating wetlands issues and changing how wetlands are determined because some of the history of that decision making at the state level was determined by some old criteria that probably does not uh, work in today's uh, wetlands litigation. So the, uh, Dustin is absolutely correct. The uh, development of uh, the west and south in the town is stymied by the lack of the west side interceptor being in position to accept new development. However, I think the positive side of that is that it's given the city and the planning department and the planning commission an opportunity to infill those areas that are small and have been vacant for some time within the city. I think that's a very positive thing in terms of getting density in uh, those areas that have maybe not had any development for some time. As you move around the city, I, s I know you probably see those small lands and, and uh, acreages that are, have construction in them on the corners of streets and, and and small areas uh, adjacent. Karen? Well, these are really complex issues. And honestly, to give it a fair shake, to be able to answer it in 60 seconds, I couldn't even begin to do it justice. There are actually two questions in that one question. One's about wetlands, and then one is about the wastewater collection. The wetlands uh, issue, a lot of that is out of the hands of the individual city uh, because there are, like uh, Wayne had said, other people have decided what makes a wetland. And I do believe that the definition got changed recently, which is to our benefit. And there are ways to sort of mitigate a wetland and there's uh, basically a, a savings account, so to speak, that you can put monies towards or you know move land over here and do something with this over there. It's very, very convoluted. But the city is working and uh, I'm trying to, well, the current council is trying to figure out those steps and what can we do to help that growth on the west and the south side of our town. The wastewater collection is, uh, again, very complex. I, I spoke with uh, the, the engineering director, uh, Ron, about this because, again, uh, th these are pretty complex issues. And there is this thing called the West Side Interceptor, and they're trying to get um, more uh, sewage lines to the, to the west and the south end and get that hooked up. And right now they're at Oaken Airway, and they sort of have stopped at this point. And the way with our finances, I mean, I will tell... <coughs> <laughs> I forget who got it finish. next. Well, it's more than a sentence, so that's not okay. fair. <laughs> Messes up your train of thought. 
Michelle, you're up next. Well, similar, similarly to what Karen um, discussed, uh, this is a very complex issue and there are two questions in this single question. So the West Side Interceptor, um, this is very critical, important infrastructure that needs uh, to be put in place before really um, any more building can really happen on that south end of town. And without that, uh, we're, we're kind of stuck. The council has done um, lots of things they've, they've to, to try and spur this. It's the city has spent money when it's had money to lengthen the west side interception, or interceptor pipe, um, but other avenues should be explored, as the question mentions. Uh, urban Renewal District um, is, a, is an avenue to do that, and that would put funds aside to, to spend in a certain area and to help fund some of that infrastructure. Um, there are certainly other strategies as well that could be examined, but um, the key thing of this question is that grow not growing is not an option. Growing in a measured, uh, responsible fashion is how we should grow, and uh, the West Side Interceptor and other infrastructure to that area is very key to that. The other piece, the wetlands issue, the city has made some progress on that. I know um, that is also in the 2040 plan, um, looking at ways to address that issue. Um, again, that's going to be important for the north side of town and, uh, you know, solving some of those issues so we can have more um, industrial businesses on those industrial lands. Um, doing, again, doing nothing, not an option, but all strategies should really be on the table to solve these two issues. Thank you. Greg? Well answered, Michelle. Uh, Yes, uh, all of these issues are complex issues, uh, but they're not new. Uh, when I came here 22 years ago, we were facing the same thing in other areas. Uh, uh, my forte was more or less the power uh, infrastructure, uh, but we faced the same things, same problems, uh, same issues, and uh, we mitigated them successfully. Uh, growth is the answer. Continued, well-planned growth for the community. Uh, you see the results uh, all around us today. Uh, this was a different community 20 years ago, and it will be a different community in another 20 years. Uh, we will meet the challenges. Uh, we will find the answers. Uh, they can be complex, but uh, the problems can be met. Uh, as far as, uh, as the, the two parts of the question, uh, the wetlands issues are uh, doable. Uh, the uh, West Side Interceptor is going to be expensive. Uh, there is no one fix for it. We'll give Greg a minute to uh, rest his voice while we, before we hit him with another question. Um, just a reminder, if you have questions for the council candidates, get those written down. Shelley, you're going to gather those. Um, hold them up and Shelley will come running. Greg, are you ready for number two? I'm ready for number we're, two. We're reversing the order. All right. Here's the second question. The city is working on implementing the Lebanon 2040 Vision and Community Action Plan. Please review the 2040 plan in terms of what in the plan you would prioritize, what you would remove, if anything, and what you might add, as well as how you would propose to pay for it. Greg, you're up. Is there a question out here? Okay. <laughs> Charlie, thank you. Uh, as far as uh, familiarizing myself with the 2040 uh, vision plan, uh, I did that. Uh, it's a uh, it's a very complete document. Uh, it was uh, uh, comprised of the work of uh, many uh, of you uh, citizens out there. Uh, uh, it's, it's fairly complete. Uh, there are uh, areas in there that speak to the uh, arts. 
uh, to the uh, uh, arts culture in the community, uh, to the downtown uh, uh, historic uh, redevelopment, uh, to education, uh, on to uh, being a healthy, vital community. Uh, how do we uh, create uh, new jobs? How do we grow the community? Uh, and public safety in our community. Uh, and how do we do this uh, in, in keeping with our small town values? Uh, I can't add to the work that's been done uh, in here, and I wouldn't uh, detract from it by uh, removing anything from it. Michelle? Thank you. So when I first got this question, one thing that struck me was that it implies that things can be cut from this plan. Um, I do not feel that that is the case, having worked on the task force that helped um, guide this, this planning process. So this plan um, was, we, we went through this process about two years ago now, 1,100 people within Lebanon um, um, gave their opinion on what we want Lebanon to look like in 2040. It was about a year-long process that involved community like ourselves here in this room. It involved stakeholders. It involved partners. It was really a wide swath of our community. Uh, it's not just the city's document either. It is, it's our community's document. You'll see things in there if you, if you check it out. There are action items in there that, are, that relate to the Boys and Girls Club, that relate to the Arts Commission, that, and then, of course, that relate to the city itself. Um, again, these are not my priorities, they're the city's priorities and they're our community's priorities. So cutting anything, changing anything from this plan, I would really um, discourage that. In fact, in my mind, this document should be the um, guiding force for the council moving forward. It was something that was created from the people um, you know, to guide the council and their decisions throughout. And we've seen some of that in some of the council's um, decisions. They've actually referred to some of those decisions. Um, when they've made decisions, they've referred to the plan and specific action items within the plan um, when it was appropriate. Um, if one thing needs to be prioritized or of another, and I'm, again, this is really forcing that, but I would say it's the, having a safe community because that really speaks to the community's livability. Thank you. Karen? Well, thank you. So since moving here in our uh, great town here in 2000, um, I've really got to see quite the change that ha was happening. Um, so it's been a nice um, growth for myself and, and my partner as well. Uh, I actually sat down with Michelle um, a little while ago to talk to her about this because she was on this committee and it was truly um, amazing. I, I do remember going to a meeting um, over at the library on one of these topics and kind of listening to see what people's idea were uh, for our future here. And, um, and I totally agree with Michelle. I think to sort of cut anything is not really the objective. I think this group, which she said was, you know, involved, you know, community members just like you and stakeholders, business owners, you know, clergy, I mean, a, a big array of people who are a part of our community and wake, make our community what it is today. I do believe in growth, um, but uh, a measured growth, because I love the small town. Remember I told you I came from a big town and I couldn't wait to get out of here? Well, I'm still here, and I went from a bigger city to a smaller city. I love this town. And the things that the community thought were really important are some really great things here. And I don't know if you've seen this document, but there's, uh, like Mr. Uh, McGregor said here, you know, arts and culture, downtown, education, health community, jobs and growth, and of course, safety community, and then just our small town values. I think if I had to choose, of course, with 25 years of law enforcement experience, I'm going to say us being safe is very, very important. So that will be a, one of my key things. Wayne Rieskamp. Uh, thank you. Uh, many of the topics in 2040 were, have been brought to your attention by those that have spoken. I'm going to... Uh, talk a little bit about a couple of things that meant a lot to me in participating in the 2040 plan as a council member. I'm president of the local Boys and Girls Club and Parks and Recreation are a huge uh, priority of mine. 
Uh, we, when I first came to Lebanon, we had uh, individual programs that addressed, you know, the youth, and we also had programs that addressed adults. We have not had that for years. Uh, so I am very interested in that the Parks and Recreation uh, district would allow that to happen here in Lebanon and broaden the scope of recreation for youth and adults. The other area that I certainly uh, supported, I support them all, but the health and safety of Lebanon is certainly a priority on top of all of our list. The uh, making sure that the city budget uh, is able to fund our police department at a level that is sufficient for the size of this community. Uh, the downtown uh, renovation of buildings and helping uh, redo the storefronts and the facades so that you know entrepreneurs can go ahead and rent those or buy those and bring in new business. And Dustin. So the 2040 vision plan covers a wide variety of topics and it was produced by the community for what they wanted to see. Uh, city staff have made good progress in identifying the areas they're responsible for and coming up with a plan to implement those action items. But I pose the question to you is who's responsible for coordinating and overseeing implementation of the parts of the plan that the city is not responsible for? Uh, what I would prioritize would be identifying who's responsible for coordinating this plan and making sure that it comes to fruition. Um, many of the action items in the plan don't include the city as either a partner or a potential partner. Who's working with the school district to coordinate their action items? The Boys and Girls Club, Lynn Benton, the Chamber of Commerce. Those are just a few of the partners that are needed to see that the 2040 vision plan comes to fruition. So without someone to coordinate and follow up with these partners, I envision the plan only partly working. The city took the lead in creating this document. I believe the city needs to designate somebody to be responsible for the implementation of this document. Lebanon is currently recruiting for the position of economic development catalyst. I would propose that the list of responsibilities for this person or for this position that they coordinate and oversee the implementation of the 2040 vision plan. Every part of this plan has an effect directly or indirectly on the economic development and it would make sense to have this person coordinating since they're already in the budget and it's already paid for. Okay, now we have the questions that they've not been able to prepare for. These are the questions from the audience. I've changed the order here so we don't have to go right back to you, Dustin. Um, first up is Michelle. And here's the question. Okay. Um, will moving in at Samaritan, oh boy, expand LBCC, elevate housing, prices beyond ability of Le uh, <laughs> Lebanon no. to afford it? If so, what measures can be taken to help families stay in town? Can you Price, repeat it one more real time? Real estate prices, I think, is what we're talking about. Did you understand that question? No. <laughs> it got a little vague there in the middle. Talking about all the, the development that's happening that we're so excited about, is that going to increase the, the, the cost of living to the extent that people can't live here anymore? If I got that, it says, if so, what measures can be taken to help families stay in town? Okay. Um, I think part of this question, again, honestly, I feel like some of it comes back to that um, West Side Interceptor. And again, trying to, to solve ways that we can essentially create more housing and more development for this city. Um, housing prices are high. I, I believe they're high. I moved into my neighborhood about three years ago, and I'm amazed at how much the, the house has gone up um, just in those three years. Um, but 
but looking forward how to keep people in their homes. Um, we are in a very gifted community that, um, you know, we're sitting here in the River Center. The River Center has services for people that are, that are in need or maybe even on the brink of possibly losing a home. Um, I know I've talked with um, Dave Albanese, our community service officer, and very important for him is working with people that are on the brink of becoming homelessness and connecting them with resources um, so they don't wind up, um, you know, in living on the streets. So I think working um, both with those services that we already have in town and making those a little widely known, those, that's a strategy to certainly help people keep, or keep people in their home. Um, it doesn't really solve like the housing prices. I mean, I don't think that, that any of us here have a single-handed strategy to, to lower housing prices in Lebanon, but if we can continue with services and keep the connecting people with the resources to keep them in their homes, that's a way to, to, to address this issue. Thank you. Dustin, you're up next. So I have five kids, three of which are old enough to be out on their own. Two of them have to live with roommates. Then the third one is only working part time and can't afford to be out on their own. The housing prices are crazy. And I sometimes think that she'll never be able to afford to get out on her own and neither will the other two. And I'll be stuck with them forever. But <laughs> that's fine. I'm okay with that. <laughs> uh, the, uh, it, there's a lot of philosophical questions that can go with that. A lot of people say we need to build more houses, more apartments. You know, yes, the apartments are full, the houses are full. There's, you know, you can have this argument back and forth all day long. Fact is, we do need more apartments. We do need more housing. Um, it'll help bring the prices down a little bit because it'll be more available. But at the same time, once there's more available, more people will move into town, prices will continue to go up. Um, prices are what they are. So we need to be able to bring in family wage jobs and continue that development with shovel-ready sites uh, so that people can afford to live here in Lebanon. Um, it's a great community. People want to be here. And that's reflected of the housing prices right now because people do want to live here. Um, so it's a tough one. There's a lot of answers and there's a lot of consequences to it. I don't believe there's any one right answer one way or the other. Uh, as far as housing prices go, we just need to have more apartments build up and more houses to build out. Greg is next. Is that? Are we ready? Go ahead, Greg. Okay, I'm going to be real brief here. <laughs> uh, Greg, wait, we got to start. We got to get learn about the timing. Okay. Go, Greg. All right. As I understand the question, uh, uh, same question, uh, being uh, the high cost of living and cost of living is increasing. We all know that. It always has. Uh, really, the, the uh, solution to that is uh, continuing uh, with our economic development uh, uh, goals, uh, bringing more job more uh, industry to the community, uh, more jobs, uh, uh, more give, give people the ability to uh, uh, pay for uh, all of this new uh, infrastructure. Um, as, far as, as far as the people that own property in the community, uh, I, I certainly have seen my property values go up, my taxes have gone up, but uh, at such time as uh, I wish to maybe sell and, and move on, I'm, I'm going to realize the uh, 
increase uh, in my property values. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a give and take uh, situation here. Um, no real easy answers. That's about all I've got to say on. Karen, you're next. Well, like everybody else has already said, the, the key here, I think, is, I, I agree here, is the, the growth that we're, we've been doing. We've, got, we've had companies come in, you know, Lowe's, Laticrete, we've got the north side development coming in. And so as we have industrial companies come here who then can draw from our community to employ, I think those are some of the answers. It is very complex and, you know, everywhere you go, the, the cost of, of living is very expensive. I think we're still doing pretty well. Uh, you start looking at, you know, our neighboring communities and they are definitely that higher than we are. Um, my, my gig is that I think we have it great here. I think we've got a small community. Yes, you know, it is expensive, but I think the draw is that people like the small community and we've got people coming in. And in my own community, uh, I live up near the hospital area, I don't know how many properties that were kind of downtrodden, not looking very good, they were vacant, and people are coming in, they're buying them, they're flipping them, and we've got new families coming in. Uh, I've got a new neighbor two doors down that it took two days on the market, and she's going to be a great um, uh, asset to our, to our neighborhood. Uh, so things like that are already happening, you know, and so I think that the continued growth that we could do and push for that, again, limited. I don't want to get crazy, uh, you know, be Portland or anything like that, but I do believe that we do need to grow. We are very, very fortunate to have Comp Northwest here. That's another one. Um, and all the properties that are up there on Samaritan that have really um, have been a good shot in the arm for our community. Wayne, you figured it out. You're next. Yeah, well, not much left to say, but I totally agree with the comments that have been made, uh, you know, many years ago, 15 or 16, when I ran for city council. You know, job development, uh, health and safety, and streets, street conditions were what I ran on. But in order to keep prices uh, at an affordable uh, level for those people that are struggling or those people that are going to be coming to Lebanon, we have to have residential, commercial, and industrial growth. All of that contributes to more tax dollars in order to fix streets and to maintain our uh, health and safety issues that come before uh, the city as needed. The, the building, uh, as you know, we went through a spurt of drastic building people from outside the, our communities that were paying much higher prices came here. I would like to see Lebanon maintain its small community values and, and atmosphere, but quite honestly, folks, growth is what's going to stimulate and help people be able to afford uh, housing and uh, to buy homes here in Lebanon. And we have, as we've commented earlier in this session, that the west side interceptor will help that immensely. Uh, the the uh, tax dollars. Thank you. Okay, we've got a new order and a new question. Greg, you're first. What do you feel is the one change that needs to occur in Lebanon? What do I feel is the one change that needs to occur in Lebanon? Uh, just a uh, overall abiding community feeling that, that we are something special. We all know it in our hearts that we're sp something special. But I'm going to tell you a little quick story here. When I came here in 1995 and was offered the job, uh, I was told, well, the job is out of the Philomath office, but we're going to have to require you to live over in Lebanon. We're sorry about that. That really rattled my rafters. I, uh, I had been to Lebanon. It was a cute community. 
uh, had a few problems, but uh, I was happy to live here. And in the uh, 22 plus years that I have lived here, it's uh, been a welcoming, warm community, uh, and we've all got to, to have that feeling in our heart about our community. Uh, this is a fabulous community. Uh, and it's only going to get better with time. I've seen so much improvement uh, since I've worked and lived here. Uh, many, many great changes. Uh, fabulous city staff. Uh, Karen, you're next. Boy, I honestly don't think that there should be... I don't see a change needed. I will tell you when I first moved here, um, there were a few things that I saw and the direction that the council and the city manager were going in, I didn't agree with. Well, we've had new blood uh, energized our city. We, in the last eight years at least, we've got a great mayor, we've got a city council that is moving forward and they have taken us to where we are today. I used to, when I came here, because being a police officer wasn't enough adrenaline, I was a volunteer firefighter here. And I remember when the mills started closing, and some of my you know, cohorts in, in the fire department, they were losing their jobs, and they had to be re-educated. And so our town really went through some major, major growth. But I see the way the council is working right now, and they are really pushing us to this, where we are. I mean, Samaritan Village and Comp Northwest, I will tell you, they tried to go cor to Corvallis and they thumbed their nose at them. And then so uh, the Lynn County Commissioners and, the, and our uh, leaders here in our community, they courted them and say, listen, we want you. And what do we have? Look what we have on the north end of town. It is amazing. So I, I honestly, I just am gonna get on the shirt tails of what is already going great and tweak a few things, you know, some things need to happen, but nothing that's, you know, spectacular. Every, but we all know what we need to continue to do, you know, the infrastructure, this, you know, the, the, um, the pipeline that we're talking about for the water, the West Line Interceptor, I mean, all West Side inter Interceptor, all those things need to continue to happen and I wanna help that to continue to go forward. Michelle. So the one change that needs to occur in Lebanon, this is actually, I feel like, I would rephrase it as maybe the one priority that we really need to focus on for Lebanon, because I do agree, we live in a great community. Um, you know, it's, I feel it's a comfortable community. We're small, but we have, we're growing, and we're growing at a measured rate, and that's all very beneficial to this, the livability of our community. But the one thing that I would say we need to prioritize is the wetlands issue. Um, again, this is not something probably that Lebanon it ourselves can can solve but through partnerships again um, Wayne talked about working with the League of Oregon cities I think that's an avenue to chase up I think uh, maybe working with lobbyists is a way to chase it up and certainly with this economic development catalyst um, I know that was reopened again for for um, hire but finding a solution to this wetlands issue is important because once we can do that we can actually we can entice more um, more industrial uh, companies to come to town. We have Intech, we have Laticrete, and we have a whole area on that north end of town that is just significantly um, underdeveloped and could be providing us with, with solid family wage jobs. Um, what the solution is to, to solving that wetlands mitigation issue, I don't have the answer, but it needs to be a priority, and it was a priority in the 2040 plan. Um, I think that would be the biggest um, change that really needs to occur, or the biggest priority that we need to set for ourselves in this new council. Thank you. Dustin? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I would be a mess, but I'd have to say that uh, transforming Lebanon into a soccer community from a football community, but no. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> There's a lot of little things, I think, um, that could be changed, uh, priorities, you know. Overall, I think Lebanon is going in a good direction, has been for many years. Um, you know, a lot of people have different opinions about, you know, we should do this versus that. Um, as far as one particular thing, um, 
nothing's really coming to my mind right now except for the priority on Lebanon's infrastructure. Um, I know we've been spending a lot of money on parks and, you know, kind of beautifying and streets and getting things up and fixed. And I think setting a higher priority for infrastructure so that we can plan and take care. Infrastructure is expensive and we need to plan long term for that for these big projects like the West Side Interceptor and the water treatment plant and all these other things. You know, they're gonna have to be repairs made on the water lines and the sewer lines and everywhere else. And we need to prioritize those infrastructure things a little bit higher so that we could take a small bite out of that every year rather than ignore it, ignore it, ignore it, and then have to raise everybody's rates really high because it's gotta be fixed right now. Wayne. You know, two years ago, uh, the council uh, and staff uh, asked you, the citizens, to tell us what you felt were priorities and the best things to happen in Lebanon, Oregon. That was where the 2040 vision plan came from. There are many uh, items, and you've seen them or have heard about them, uh, to prioritize them is kind of, I guess, selfish on my part because they're all important and they all should be a priority. But the key that I think will keep Lebanon uh, better than our neighbors is that we need to have jobs for our young people to graduate from high school, or graduate from Lynn Benton or any other college in the state and come back home and find a job that's a family wage job that they can stay here in this community with their mom and dad, their brothers and sisters. And we are moving in that direction. But uh, many times we at the city get developers come in or we try and recruit people and they will tell us that we are not large enough. And so I know I've asked a couple of them myself, well, how large should that be before we can get a chain restaurant in Lebanon? And that number is 20,000. Thank you. Um, each candidate for city council will now have 60 seconds to wrap up and, and make final statements. And we have a new order. And Wayne, now you're still holding the mic. You're first. Thank you, Charlie. And thank you, people in the audience, for being here to listen to each of our comments. Uh, you know, in wrapping up, I would just say that this community, as I believe Greg emphasized so diligently, that we are a fine community that I think is, for the most part, serving the citizens well. We have dissatisfaction, of course, complaints about uh, water prices, uh, you know, why is the sewer price so high? Why do we have uh, to pay for the water that runs off our roofs? Most of those things happen because of uh, federal government or state government regulations that they're passed on to city councils to implement. Uh, the results of those things cause prices to increase. You know, many years back when I was first on council, we... Greg, you're next. Thank you. Uh, as I stated before, uh, I came to this community uh, to help uh, uh, build up some of the infrastructure. Uh, I spent uh, the last 20 years or so doing that. Uh, lots of volunteerism. Uh, seen a lot of progress in this community. Uh, I want to see that progress continuing to happen. Uh, I love this community. Uh, I ask for your support, uh, ask for your vote uh, on November 6th. Uh, you've, got, uh, you've got a great, 
great community here, and it's only going to get better. And uh, any one of us would make make a good candidate. Uh, uh, we're all caring people up here. Karen? Well, as we come to a close, I, I too want to thank all of you for taking the time out of your afternoon to come down here and, and listen to us and to ask some of these really great questions. Um, I know I'm running unopposed, but I hope for those that are in Ward 2 that I have earned your vote. I care about our city. I, have, I chose to move here from another community. I love it here. We've been here for 18 years. Um, quite honestly, I've got friends uh, and neighbors that were born and raised here and have gone to high school here. And when I hear them reminisce, I'm jealous because I don't have that. You know, I went to a huge high school in the Bay Area. I moved here, and I, it, just, it just tickles me to hear them talk. Will you remember when? And that, to me, just like encapsulates, or encapsulates, however you say that word, um, just what this community is about. You know, we care about each other. You know, we're strong. We have good values here. We love our football. Go Warriors, last year when they were the winners. Um, thank you very much. Michelle. Well, before that bell dings, um, I want to thank you all for coming and, and let you know that I'm actually planning on staying to the end of this uh, event and I'll be out front if anyone has questions afterwards. Also, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm on Facebook, Michelle Steinhabel for Lebanon City Council. Uh, with all of that said, I would be honored to be your next uh, city councilor for Ward 3. Um, I am I'm involved in this community. This community is my home. I'm raising my family here um, who are out at dance and jujitsu thanks to my, my mother who is, is shipping them around tonight. But, um, you know, we have a really good thing going in Lebanon. It's a tremendous community to live in, to work, live, and raise a family. And I would be honored to be a part of council to ensure that that happens in the future. And thank you. I made it before the bell. <laughs> Dustin. So I do have to say that uh, the Warriors do have a soccer team as well as a football team. But, <laughs> but thank you all again for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I ask for your vote and a chance to represent Ward 3 on the City Council. I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce and Charlie Eads, our moderator, uh, for being here tonight. And yeah, I want to thank the other candidates, Michelle and, and Greg, for... Uh, making it a fun race and if you have any additional questions or would like to continue the conversation regarding the community feel free to reach out to me on Facebook or at my website electdenver.com and together I believe that through good stewardship we can all continue to make Lebanon a friendly and thriving community thank you thank you candidates Wayne, Ron Passmore, 25 years ago, told me how to pronounce your last name. I guess something about seeing it in writing threw me for a loop. Thank you very much. Good job, everyone. We're now, we'll switch over to mayoral candidates. We'll take a little bit of a break, so. I want to thank Ryan Murphy and Marks and Time Photography back there is videotaping this whole thing. So, as scintillating as it is, you can go home and watch it again. I don't know, are you going to put it on YouTube? What's it going to be on, Ryan? Who knows? <laughs> It'll be available. Mayoral candidates are in place. And we've got the, the, uh, the questions. Let's do the self-introductions. You get one minute, I think, for self-introductions. And the first up is Tom Gregory. Hi. I'm Tom Gregory. I am running for mayor, of course. But a uh, little bit about me, I, am, I have 23, 22 years of military service. I retired military. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in adult education and a master's degree in management and leadership. Um, I hope to help our community. The reason that I am running for mayor is that I actually feel that I would like to help lead this community and, and its growth and help it go into the 21st or into the 22nd century. Thank you. Next, Paul Aziz. 
I want to thank the Chamber for providing this forum for the community and a big thank you to each and every candidate who's willing to give up their time to serve. In 2012, I was elected as the Mayor of Lebanon and I served three terms as Mayor. During that time, many positive changes have happened. With my leadership, the City Council has been working together better than ever. We've had every meeting posted on YouTube for public viewing since I became Mayor and now they're live streamed. During the past six years, I fulfilled every campaign promise that I made. The Lebanon 2040 vision process and strategic plan was a top priority when I became mayor, and I'm pleased at the outcome. We had a tremendous amount of input from our community, giving the council direction and tools to make decisions for the future. I uh, we continue working hard on economic development in Lebanon. We have a new economic development position, and we're working on solving the wetlands issues. I believe that in everything there must be balance, and as mayor there's a lot of multitasking and balance is important. From attending meetings to speaking to groups to attending events, all of these things are important, not just showing up to events to be visible. Thank you. And Bob Elliott. Hey, uh, can you hear me okay? Okay, I know my time's running here. As a native Oregonian who grew up in the Lebanon area, I'm devoted to making a difference in our community and striking a balance between growth and that hometown feeling we all cherish and love about Lebanon. Uh, you know, the city is the, known as the friendly cities, and I agree with that. A little bit about me now. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, uh, I, I like I said here, I was born and raised in the Lebanon area and graduated from the Lebanon High School. I, I worked in the woods and uh, the sawmills that we had many of them back at that time, and. Uh, then eventually the plywood mill. And at that point, uh, I was recruited by American... You, you can finish up, finish up. Yeah, I was recruited by American Plywood Association where I worked for 30 years. Okay. Now we've got the same questions uh, that uh, you've been given in advance. And I've changed the order a little bit, but uh, Bob, you happen to be first. And I will read the question for the audience again. It's a little bit involved. Albany, Adair, and even Corvallis are seeing significant residential and commercial developments moving forward. But developing our prime commercial industrial land is not competitive in the market because of necessary wetland mitigation. Residential development on the southwest end of town will require significant investment in the wastewater collection system. What should the city's role in financing these projects be? Another URD or something else or nothing? Okay, this is the west side intercepting that we're talking about. Like this? Okay. Uh, is now dead ended at Oak and Airway. The wetland issue is a problem, but we're currently working on this, trying to solve this problem. I know that we have had several uh, developments that wanted to come to Lebanon that could not do it because of the price of the land due to the wetlands, but we're working on that. The uh, wastewater collection system will, will require approximately 11 to $12 million to complete, complete the system. We presently have 3.9 million to work with. 2.6 million of this comes from the, the SDCs. The, uh, the plan is to continue to 6th and Walker next year. This is a pay-as-you-go plan. <clears throat> I don't believe the city should pay for this to enable a housing project to, to, to develop. It should the uh, system developer, the developers should pay for their share when this comes possible. We were about, uh, the uh, URD system, uh, we already have three and one more possible. And I don't believe we should do another one. I think we're pretty much maxed out on that. 
I just uh, think the answer to all this is pay as you go. Thank you. Tom, you're next. I agree with Bob. I don't think that this uh, should be where the community has to pay for some developer to make a million dollars a month. It's not fair to us, okay? So what I think we need to do is we need to go with impact fees. We charge impact fees to these developers that are coming in here and charge them $15,000, $1,000 for extra for building in our community, okay? So they pay the extra money instead of the citizens. It's not right that the citizens, some old lady that's barely making ends meet, has to pay $250 a month for water bill. It's crazy. So I think that the right answer is that. For the wetlands mitigation, it's very complicated, this question. I've been looking into it. And what I think for wetlands is what, what we need to do is we need to find these businesses that want to be part of the wetlands mitigation. Like Lowe's, for instance. They are happy that they came out here and they were proud of what they did with the wetlands. We want companies like that. We don't want companies that come in here that's going to destroy our area. We want companies that's going to build up and give us jobs. And there's ways to do this, okay? There's ways to get jobs for our kids out there. And part of it is just changing. We could do a vocational school here. Just as simple as helping have and get a vocational school. And if we have CAD operators, we're training CAD operators, these businesses are looking for that. And if they got it, guess what? We got it in our town. We've got what they need. They're going to come here. Paul. Well, wastewater and um, the <laughs> wastewater and uh, wetlands are both a real exciting party topic, I know. Uh, but actually, they really are very important uh, development issues for Lebanon. The West Side Interceptor has been in the city master plan for years, and the cost is high. The city should fund it. It's been putting money aside for the project, and phase one is due to start next year. We're always looking ways to fund the interceptor with grants and loans, not with the URD, as we're nearly maxed out on URD space. Low interest loans such as the state municipal infrastructure funds are critical to projects like this, and that's how we paid for the water treatment plant. Last year, I testified in Salem before the Joint Ways and Means Committee on how important those loans were for us in Lebanon. Thankfully, the legislature approved those loans for municipalities again. Wetlands are a big problem, and I've sat in several meetings where companies have been interested in coming to Lebanon, but due to the cost of mitigating the wetlands, it made the property so expensive they chose another location. We've started a project of reassessing the wetlands and our available land inventory, and so far we found the numbers were much higher than they should have been. Preliminary figures show that re-examining the properties are reducing the percent of wetlands significantly. We've been working on these issues with state and county officials and other municipalities. One idea we're looking at is creating a wetlands bank in our area where credits can be used to offset the wetlands on properties. Both of these are critically important for Lebanon to keep our economic development on track. And just a side note, the Lowe's issue, they had a $10 million amount that the city had to pay that we didn't know about when I came into office, and we had to pay $10 million for that wetlands mitigation. That was out of the city's pocket. Paul, you came up first again, so you're ready to keep talking. Here's question two. The city is working on implementing the Lebanon 2040 Vision and Community Action Plan. Please review the 2040 plan in terms of what in the plan you would prioritize, what you would remove, and what you might add, as well as how you would propose to pay for it. The Lebanon 2040 Vision Plan was my top priority when I ran for office in 2012. I was concerned that the community didn't have a vision. I wanted to hear from the citizens what direction they wanted to see Lebanon go. The vision process gathered input from over 1,300 participants and 3,000 unique website visits. Our strategic plan gives us a roadmap for the city council and staff on priorities. Basically, it's our to-do list, something we never had in the past. I feel that all areas in the strategic plan are as important as they were identified by the community. Many of the items on the strategic plan do not need funding, and those that do are not huge expenses. Also, many of the action items have other partner organizations as the lead. Of the 36 items on the plan, 19 are in the works or have been completed. That's not bad for two years' work. We're anticipating that number to be around 23 or completed or in progress by the end of the fiscal year. The City Council set its goals in 2017 using the vision as a guide. Number one was downtown revitalization. Number two was the water treatment plant. 
Number three was the city facilities and city hall. Number four was the Lebanon transload facility. And number five was wetlands mitigation. All of these were addressed in the 2040 vision and strategic action plan. I feel the strongest message the community sent was that they wanted downtown, that they wanted growth while retaining the small town values, and that downtown needs to be the heart of the community. And I agree. Bob? My turn, I guess, okay. I, I, I draw the names, and the, so the order is kind of random. Okay, we have made much progress on the 2040 issues. All police needs are accomplished or ongoing. Prioritizing, I would prioritize that the number one thing that I would keep in here would be the Parks and Recreation District. It's a 11, and the 11.1, .1, I would create a complete inventory of land, utilities, and development resources that are available. I would remove 5.1, develop and implement a downtown property reuse strategy for the Elks Lodge. This is now a church. I don't think this applies right now. I would pay for it by the city budget over time. Some of these items are already funded or don't need funding. Thank you. Tom? Like the mayor said, the 24 plan is actually built by the citizens, so this is what the citizens wanted to see. I think um, there are some other things the citizens want to see too, though. And if you really go 20 years out, you want to look at what this plan's going to do, you should be questioning, what's my water bill going to be in 20 years? Because that's what I'm asking. I want to know what's, what's going on, okay? So if you just add up what's been going on with the city hall and with all the other infrastructure, he's talking about replacing city hall, if you noticed. That's one of the things that actually was, it's in the plan. It's in the city's plan, which is okay. I understand why. I get it. But at the same time, where's this money coming from? It's coming from each and every one of you. You're going to pay for it. So where's this money coming from? Why, why aren't we charging the people that are coming in? There's other ways that we can do this. And one of the ways is we can change to a tourism town. Everybody looks at me and says, what? I'm telling you, we have a waterfall. We have tourism. People want to come see that waterfall. Did you watch people come around and look at the eclipse? How many people come around? What do you think they'll come around to see our waterfalls? Yes, it's not in Lebanon. I get it. But if you go to Disney World, they say it's in Orlando. It's in Kissimmee. It's not in Orlando. We're the big city, okay, next to the waterfall. Come see the waterfalls in Lebanon. That'll fill your businesses. People will start coming down the street, and they'll start making money here. Let's do that. Thank you. Questions from the audience? And up first is Bob. Get the mic ready. What is the greatest challenge facing Lebanon in the next five to ten years, and what will you do to face that challenge? Well, our biggest challenge that we've got right now is this wastewater system. And uh, we've got to correct that, uh, that along with the wetlands problem that we have. I don't know what the solution to that is, but, well, we've got to get it done. It's just uh, ridiculous the way it is. Those are the things that I would say. Thank you. Tom, same question. I agree that, that the water problem is, a, is one of the big problems, but I also think that there's no work here. There's not a lot of work. Most of the people that work here are traveling to Salem. They're traveling to, to Eugene. They're traveling everywhere else but Lebanon. Let's put jobs here. So I think that would be my priority. I'm going to put a priority to getting jobs here for your people, for us, for our kids. That's important to us. So if, if that's not what you want to hear and you want another park, then let's get another park. But I don't, I don't think we need any more parks. We have 12 of them, okay? And most cities this size don't have 12 parks. We have two colleges. Most cities this size don't have two colleges. We have a veterans home, and a lot of people don't even know. There's only 50 of them in the United States. We have one here. 
So, and most of these people are real heroes. These are real heroes that's done something for us. So let's take care of what we got. Let's show people, let's show these businesses that come in here that want, want to put businesses in here, let's show them the community that they're going to see. That's what they need. They need to show, we need to sell the, our community a little better. We're not selling our town correctly. We need to sell it better. Thank you. Paul? I think the biggest challenges we I've already talked about and droned on about is the wetlands and the uh, west side interceptor. Those are both key to growing the city uh, at a reasonable rate, not excessive, but growing it reasonably. And I think those two big things. And I think there's a third thing uh, that is really big that nobody really talks about, which is PERS reform. Um, the PERS reform is huge. It, it's going to cost us a lot. It already has. And what it is is they've overspent, and we are having to pay a lot more as a city into that, and it's really hurting the budget. So I think those are all three major things. Uh, and that also goes with working with League of Oregon Cities and advocacy to the state uh, and dealing with those issues. But I think those are some of the most important things. Uh, we're on track. We're doing really well. Our budget is balanced. We have a good budget. Um, we have a reserve of over 20%. Uh, when I started as mayor, it was way down in less than the teens. Uh, it was very, very small. So we actually have a reserve that we've built up. And the city, I think, is doing pretty well. You can just look around and see. OK, next question starts uh, with Tom. And it's a, it's a school question. Is there a quote unquote rule in the city that schools will be upgraded as population of kids grow? Um, I believe that the schools are actually, that's correct. There is a rule. It's like 2,000 students. If there's more than 2,000 students, I believe they have to actually build another school. But um, I don't know whether the city is responsible for that. I think that's another different monies that does that. It's not actually the city that does that. Um, but it still don't matter. We could still as a city, we could support a Votech school, and if we can't, we can actually build a Votech school ourselves, and we can help with, you know, growing our infrastructure. That's what we want to do. We want to build this town. Let's do that. Paul, same question. Yeah, that is a, a question for our uh, chair of the uh, uh, the uh, school board, and that would be Tom Oliver. And I think he's in the audience, but we, we won't bother Tom for that. Uh, you're welcome. There you are. Uh, but seriously, the vocational training, I agree, is really critical and very important. Um, I was not happy years ago when they went to the academy process and they got rid of wood shop and metal shop. It's coming back, and the program uh, that the chamber's been supporting, that the city's been supporting, uh, with many of the companies and organizations with doing vocational training into the high schools is really going well. And in fact, they're booked so much that they're ha they don't have room for all the kids that want to take these classes, learning robotics and engineering and some of the other skills, welding uh, and some of those things. I think that's important. But yeah, he's correct. There, there is no, the city doesn't have any jurisdiction over the school board. School board takes care of that uh, financially or whatever. We just don't have anything to do with that. I have to agree with Paul on this. Uh, this is a school board issue, not a city issue. Uh, I do feel that uh, we need a vocational school of some kind. I know that uh, many of the businesses around are crying for help, and they can't find people that are, uh, are able to do the work that they want done. So that's a big problem. Uh, I think, too, another problem as far as the getting the workers is the drug problem. That's something that we need to correct also. Thank you. Hang on to the mic, Bob. Okay. You each now have 60 seconds to wrap things up, um, make final statements, and we're starting with you. I shuffled the names again. Okay, this is my final statement. This is your, fi <laughs> your final <laughs> statement. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'd just like to say that I, I've been on the city council for 16 years, and I've been the council president for 12 years, and I've been the acting mayor one time for five months while Mayor Toome was off sick, and also another month after that. 
And I've also filled in for the present mayor while he was sick on different occasions also. I know how to run the council meeting and I, I know what the job is, what, what has to be done. I'm passionate about economic development. Uh, the downtown issue, uh, I want to re revitalize the downtown, also assisting the homeless and improving parks and recreation systems. I'm dedicated to be involved with my community. I'm members of the Strawberryan Board, the Willamette Manor Board, the Bulb Panel, Rotary, and Western Uni University of Volunteer Greeter and Interviewer for um, incoming candidates. Thank you. Tom, you're next. I'd like to thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, Albert Einstein, I believe, said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. Well, if you hire the same person over and over again and you ex expect to change, that's what you get. So if you, that's the point. I'm, I've got different ideals. I'm not a candidate. I'm not a politician. I am a candidate, but I'm not a politician. I'm, I've never been a politician. I'm just a person just like you. You see me out there in town. You'll see me at the Safeway, the Buy Mart, the Walmart. You see me out in town. That's where I am. I'm out in town. I think that both of these two guys, hopefully you'd see them out in town, because if you don't, there's a problem. You need a mayor that's going to be out there, out there talking to you and hearing your problems and listening to you. And that's what you need. You need somebody. So vote for me on November 6th. Thank you. Paul? Serving my community is something I really do feel strongly about. Together with the city council, city administration, and many other organizations, we've done much to improve the livability for residents over the past six years. From attracting businesses to better parks and recreation, Lebanon has changed a lot. But one thing is certain, the changes have been very positive for our community. The mayor needs to be a strong leader and have a vision and new ideas. The community vision, strategic plan, and Strawberry Plaza were all part of a vision I had for Lebanon. One recent idea put into action is the committee I appointed to create the Lebanon Museum to preserve and display the rich history of Lebanon. Fresh ideas, working hard, and getting things done are key to being an effective leader and mayor. Showing up to public events to be seen or visible is not the most important part of being mayor. I believe in supporting organizations and causes. However, the most important job is getting things done. Whether it's in a boring meeting or dealing with complaints from citizens, I do get the job done. I enjoy living and serving in Lebanon, the city that Friendliness built, and I hope to give you, that you will give your support and reelect Paul Aziz the right choice for mayor. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you, candidates. Next up will be the uh, candidates for Lynn County Circuit Judge, positions one and position three. Charlie. Yes, ma'am. Four. Position one, Lynn County Circuit Judge. We'll start with self-introductions. And Michael Winhausen, I've got you up first in the drawing. Okay. Yep. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me first by, begin by thanking you all for coming out tonight and listening to what we have to say. And I hope to be able to answer any and all questions that you may have going forward. Uh, for a position like this, experience matters. And it's not just, I mean, we all have experiences, but it's the quality of experience that people have that's important. I've been a prosecutor and a member of the Oregon State Bar for over 22 years. I've worked in Lynn County as a prosecutor for the Lynn County District Attorney, both Jason Carlisle and Doug Martini, for over 15 years. And I've worked in this courthouse for that period of time. I know the people who are there, I know the judges, I know the court staff, and I know how it works. And so uh, in addition to, to that experience, what's really important, because we're, we're all attorneys, we all have different experiences, we all have different focuses in our practice, but what's really important is litigation experience. And I have 22 years of litigation experience. I've prosecuted thousands of cases over my career, literally, and tried hundreds. I have the experience for this position, and I'm asking you for your vote. Thank you. Faye Stetswaters. Is that it? 
Thank you, Chamber of Commerce, for inviting us to speak tonight. I'm so happy to be in the city that friendliness built. I love your logo. It embodies your values of friendliness, community, and optimism. My name is Faye Stetz Waters, and I'm one of your circuit court judges. And I've witnessed, personally, that friendliness at your Distinguished Service Awards dinner. As a Marine Corps veteran, I've also witnessed the community when I visited the veterans' home and was humbled by what I saw. Veterans being treated the way they deserve to be treated. The veterans' home is a flagship model of care for our whole country. I also saw on this very stage the optimism that this community represents. Children who were acknowledged by their teachers and the Optimist Club for the positivity they bring to their schools. For these values and these reasons is the reason that I chose Lynn County. I wasn't born here, but I chose Lynn County because I love this community. Judicial candidates were also given two questions in advance, which they prepared their answers for. And uh, we'll start with, uh, with Faye on this first question. You've got a minute and a half to answer these. As legal costs rise, more and more litigants are using the court system without the assistance of an attorney. What policy should the court implement to assist litigants who are not familiar with the system, but entitled to due process. Pro se litigants want attorneys, but they can't afford them. I saw this when I worked as an attorney at Legal Aid. I represented over 288 clients, but I had to turn so many away because they made too much money to qualify for our services. A pro se litigant who has to go up against a seasoned attorney has a distinct disadvantage. And though the Lynn County Courts have tried to address this with self-help forms and with a family law facilitator, we know that isn't enough. Our court staff can't give legal advice. Those forms are completely inaccessible to anyone with low literacy. So much more needs to be done. In the courtroom, I pay attention to this. I know that people have different skills, and so I try to make sure that everyone understands the reason for the hearing, the purpose of the hearing. I explain the procedures and the rules and the law so that people feel comfortable and know what to expect. But I also have to remain neutral, and that's difficult sometimes because people want help. Pro se litigants have an opportunity to have help. There are a number of services, legal assistance programs, and limited scope legal representation services that are available to pro se litigants in other places. And those present options for people so they can just figure out what all their legal options are and devise a strategy to help them. But this costs money. You have a voice in how your resources are used. You can urge your legislators and commissioners to spend resources for effective uh, pro se representation so that everyone has legal representation. Michael, same question. So you may have noticed over the last few years, companies like LegalZoom and things of that nature that are coming out, and people more and more are handling their cases themselves. Uh, now, it was pointed out that, that our court system utilizes forms and things of that nature, and I think that that's a way to allow people access to the courts by making those forms more accessible, by creating explanations that people can understand, things that are given in lay terms rather than legalese, so that people can do things themselves, file their own divorces, file their own tort claims, file for FEDs and any other number of cases that they may deal with. Now in the criminal arena, most folks who can't afford an attorney are granted one by the court, and so that's really not an issue in this situation. Uh, but if, you know, as was stated, the courts can't give out legal advice, the judges can't give special treatment to one side or the other. They have to remain fair and impartial. And so by empowering our citizens, by offering them the materials and the explanations and the instructions for taking care of these things themselves, they can avoid the very expensive legal costs, particularly for minor uh, legal actions. Okay. 
Should have thought of that earlier. Should yeah. I know? Okay, let's let's go ahead and keep the same order. I think that makes sense. We'll alternate. Faye, what in your view is the most significant problem currently facing the Lynn County Court, and how can that challenge be addressed? I think the most current uh, the problem is we only have five judges. We have a community of thousands, 125,000 folks, and we only have five judges. We, it's the same number we've had since the 1940s. And our community has grown since then. People have become more litigious since then, and people have greater need. For a short time, we had a temporary judge, a pro tem, and he handled our hearings docket. That hearings docket, held by one person allowed the other four judges to be able to have an extra week of trials and hearings. Having that extra week helped move cases through faster. You know, justice delayed is justice denied. People are waiting a long time to have their cases settled. We have cases that are over two years old and people are waiting to have resolution on those matters. Without a proper number of judges, cases are just languishing and people are waiting for support. Businesses are looking for resolutions. Families are looking for who gets custody and parenting time. And people who feel unsafe are looking for protective orders. All of these things are taking up a lot of time uh, in terms of the judges. And we need to have six judges. We were supposed to have six, but instead we got a case management system that basically has us re moving the, cas the uh, cases through 15 minutes at a time. We call it justice 15 minutes at a time, and it's not fair to our residents. We need to have a system where people can come to court, have their cases heard, and so that they can get resolution and get on with their lives. That's not happening, and it should. Michael? So I've been practicing in the courts for over 15 years here in Lynn County, and as I said, I've been prosecuting for over 22. Judges are a state office. They're funded by the state. So there is little that we can do here in Lynn County to force that issue. Uh, we've been due for a judge for quite some time, and the reality is we're not going to get it. So what do we do? We need to have some practical solutions, not hoping for the state to save us. And so one of the things that uh, we have in our community is we have a legal community that has a collegial uh, atmosphere in the, in the criminal law area. They understand how the cases are going to come out. They understand the probable outcomes, and we settle 95% of our cases short of trial. Uh, that is something I would want to encourage in other areas of the law. In addition to that, uh, it's the docket that's killing us. What ways can we find to reduce the docket in this county? Uh, we need better alternative dispute resolution. Now, all the judges engage in settlement conferences, but some are better at it than others. It would be valuable to have a training in Lynn County for all of the judges to become experts in dispute resolution and try to settle these cases without going through the long process of a full litigation or trial. And so those are the practical solutions that I see that we can solve our problem, which is a crushing docket here in Lynn County. Got two interesting questions from the audience, and we'll start with Faye on the first one, and then the second one we'll start with Michael. What is the role of a circuit court judge in the community? I think the role of a circuit court judge in the community is to be a leader, is to represent all of the values that come with the office. The judge is looked upon as a role model. And people will look to everything the judge says and everything the judge does as an example. The things, I don't get to say whatever I want wherever I go. People will, people will listen and people will repeat what has been said. And so it's very important for the judge to be a leader. The Marine Corps experience that I have had has given me the discipline and I use that discipline every day on the bench. I use it everywhere in my community. And it's helped me re place reserve on the comments that I would ordinarily make if I was an ordinary citizen, but I am not. I am the judge, and what I say will be repeated. And I am mindful of that responsibility and mindful of the burden it is to carry this community's tragedies 
and harm that has come to our people. And it takes a very important person and strong person to be able to hold that and keep those confidences. And that is a key thing that the judge can do. The judge must be fair. The judge must have the proper temperament and treat everyone with respect. There is no uh, position uh, more important in the community than making sure people have due process, they're treated with respect, it's part of our deep and constitutional rights, and it shouldn't be interfered with by someone, by anyone who doesn't respect that office. Michael? So a judge really ought to be the conscience of the community and a fair and impartial arbiter of the law. And I'm gonna discuss this in the context of the criminal law. I spent over 20 years prosecuting criminals in this and other communities. And over that 20 years, I've learned that there are essentially two different people that I end up dealing with. Those that have a bad day, make a mistake, or are going through a rough period in their life, and then those that habitually violate our laws and victimize our citizens. Because I have been doing this for over 20 years, I can see the difference. The lion's share of the crime in our community is committed by a fraction of the offenders. I can recognize who needs to be given a chance, given treatment, and given opportunities because they're gonna take it, as opposed to the people that commit crime after crime after crime and create victim after victim after victim. Those are the people we need to identify and remove from our community to protect the citizens of Lynn County. Keep the mic up, Michael. This is for you as well. A large portion of the judge's workload involves non-criminal cases. What's your previous experience with non-criminal law? Well, in addition to criminal law, I've handled uh, civil commitment hearings in my role as a prosecutor. I've also handled uh, uh, child support enforcement, as well as juvenile delinquency and juvenile dependency cases. But the fact of the matter is, no one knows everything about the law. Every attorney, much in the same way as doctors, specialize. That's how they become competent in the work that they do. I've spent my career engaging in criminal prosecution and specifically litigation. Litigation is the aspect of the law that runs through all areas of the law. As a judge, you are being relied upon to understand the rules of evidence and to understand the rules of procedure. If you don't have a good understanding of these things and you have to practice in court for years to learn them, you're gonna make a mistake. You're gonna allow a piece of evidence to come in that shouldn't or you're gonna prevent a piece of evidence that should come in uh, and exclude it from the proceeding. That can sway the result. You could have innocent people being convicted of crimes. You could have people who've been grievously injured not get sufficient recompense for their injuries. Bad things happen when judges don't have the proper experience. I have that experience, and I will use that to fulfill that position as your next Lynn County Circuit Court judge. Okay. Will you reread re the question, please? Sure. A large portion of the judge's workload involves non-criminal cases. What's your previous experience with non-criminal law? Thank you. I worked uh, as a legal aid attorney, and legal aid attorneys are generalists, and so we take many cases that come in the door. Like I said earlier, there are many cases of people we couldn't help because they made too much money, but if you are uh, below, uh, live below the poverty level and you have a legal problem, then legal aid was the place to go. And so I have a broad range of experience uh, as a result of that work, working in family law. I, like I said, I had 200, over 288 uh, clients that I served while I worked in Lynn County as an attorney. I also uh, headed uh, the, our elder law program, which is a fabulous program, which brought me into uh, um, experience with a whole bunch of different areas of law. It wasn't limited by some of the uh, mandates 
or the legal aid program. It was a different funding source. So I got to be out in the community and go to the, the uh, senior center here in Lebanon, and we go out to Sweet Home and make house calls and visit with seniors who had a variety of legal problems, including contract disputes, and if th they were getting, uh, there were consumer fraud complaints. And I remember taking a, going on a, a house call where Someone had a peacock on one side of the car, and someone had a, uh, and there was a pit bull on the other, and I couldn't figure out which side of the car I should get out on. But the uh, the, uh, the the owner, she came out and said, "Hey, she could just give a shrill whistle," and the dog went away, and I was able to get out and come and help her. But she had a contract dispute uh, involving uh, the movement of a manufactured home, and so it, it, my experience was so broad, and, and I got to deal with income cap trusts and Medicaid and helping people get public benefits that they needed. Now you each have 60 seconds to make a final statement and wrap things up. Michael, you, you want to start? Sure. So again, I want to thank you for coming out this evening. Um, a minute isn't, just, isn't enough time to discuss all the issues, and so I would uh, encourage you to stick around afterwards. I'd be more than happy to answer any and all questions you may have. Uh, you can go to my website, winhausen.com. That connects to the Facebook, but that gives you a lot of other information. Um, but as I said before, experience matters. I have over 22 years of litigation experience, more experience than any of the candidates in either judicial race that you'll be deciding in November by far. Uh, that is the experience that is appropriate for the position that's important to the position, uh, that's required uh, for pro tem judges. They have to have that litigation experience and that's what I have. And if you don't believe me, look, look to the people that support me. Uh, John Lindsay, Will Tucker, Paul Aziz, the entire law enforcement community of Lynn County, including the last three sheriffs, including Tim Muller, uh, Frank Stevenson, your chief of police. These are just a few of the people that have endorsed my campaign, and I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. Faye. Thank you. I just received the most amazing uh, news just a few hours ago. The Oregon State Bar's judicial preference poll for this position won. I won that contest. That means that the Lynn County Bar members endorsed me for this position just the same as they did at the beginning of this process when I first put my name in to fulfill my dream to become a judge in this county. It was Lynn County judges and lawyers who said, yes, you bring something unique to the bench, you have a broad range of experience, and you have a unique perspective that is beyond the criminal justice lens. We do not need a judge who is looking at for a bad guy, who is looking at things in terms of black and white. Looking our cases, quite frankly, that is going to be damaging for our bench if we have already made up our minds who is guilty and who is not, who deserves a chance and who does not. We're supposed to be impartial in making our decisions based on the law. That's what I've been doing, and I would love to continue doing it for this community. Thank you, vote. Face Death Waters, November 6th. Thank you, candidates. Thank you. I think most of the candidates will be staying after. So I'm sure there's more than the two questions, but in the interest of getting out of here on time, uh, we're limiting it to two, and Sharon's doing a wonderful job of getting representative questions. So uh, thanks for your patience on that one. We now have the two candidates for position three. Um, Rachel helped me with, uh, with her last name, so let's see if I can get it right. Rachel kitson McCottish and Terry Plagman. So welcome. Terry, would you take uh, 60 seconds and introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Terry Plegman, and I do want to correct my, my sign here. My name is spelled wrong. It's with one R. So when you see it on my campaign signs, my campaign signs are correct. Um, but I was born and raised uh, between Albany and Lebanon on a grass seed farm. My family's been in the community here for over 120 years, uh, grass seed farmers. Uh, some of you may recognize Plagman Drive, both in, there's both Plagman Drive in Lebanon and there's one in Albany as well. Um, and yes, that is actually named after my family. Um, 
And uh, I was, like I said, born and raised in Albany. I graduated from South Albany High School in 1988. I went to school at Oregon State University, and then I went to law school up in Portland. I have been a trial attorney for 21 years. Uh, right now, most of my practice is uh, family law. I've had my own business for the last 10 years. Uh, I've been a small business owner. I am married. I have three children, a 22-year-old, a 19-year-old, and an 8-year-old. And uh, I have, like I said, um, enjoyed practicing law here in Lynn County. I haven't practiced only in just Lynn County, um, but I've also practiced in other counties as well. Rachel. Hi, I'm Rachel kitson McCottish, and I'm running to be your next Lynn County Circuit Court Judge for position three. Judge Murphy retired, opening up that position. I filed along with three other candidates, and you found us on your primary ballot. In that race, I received, I believe, over 45% of the vote, and then advanced on to the general, along with Terry, who is the runner-up. I am a mother of four, a grandmother of three, and my husband and I and our two youngest live here in Lebanon. I am a partner at Morley Thomas Law, and I have 40 decades. I've lived here in Lynn County. I grew up here, I was raised here, I have grandchildren here, and I have practiced my entire career in Lebanon, in Lynn County. My experience is criminal law, family law, civil commitments, and personal injury. I prosecute for the city of Lebanon. I have a contract with the county for civil commitments. I am heavily involved in community service. My father had a sixth grade education. I was a teen mother, and I've been blessed by this community, and I've given back. Now the, uh, the questions that you've been given in advance. Uh, we'll start with Terry. As legal costs rise, more and more litigants are using the court system without the assistance of an attorney. What policy should the court implement to assist litigants who are not familiar with the system but entitled to due process? I just went a couple weeks ago to the uh, Lynn Benton Bar Association uh, Continuing Legal Education Seminar last a couple weeks ago. And one of the things that was discussed was that uh, in 2016, the Oregon State Bar, actually the Oregon Judicial Department, put out a poll, or put out a study, I'm sorry, that said that 80% of the litigants in our civil cases, in our civil docket, are unrepresented. Um, and so that actually ends up causing a backlog, not just on the civil docket, but also the criminal docket as well. And there are things that we can do. Um, and because of that, in uh, January of 2018, there was a civil um, justice improvement uh, program where they did a, ta did a task force, and that was just released in uh, just several months ago, like I said. And they identified 13 different things that they could do. One of them was to improve the alternative dispute resolution. And that's one thing that we do need to definitely work on. Uh, some other counties actually already handle that process by having settlement conferences mandatory on cases where there is a pro se person. Uh, Lynn County doesn't do that. Um, other counties also, um, uh, in other counties, and also doing a, um, litigation orientation for people that are pro se's because that is something that does take up time in the courtroom when you have somebody representing themselves they don't necessarily know the court process and so we do need to make sure that that is something by helping shore up our civil docket by helping handle some of those cases where we have pro se people on the civil docket that will help the entire docket across the board Rachel same question my first experience with the law was when I was 19 and I was a pro se litigant in a custody case. I understand how scary the legal system is without an education. I will tell you that things have really changed since then. There are so many things online right now, and the court has implemented many policies to help pro se litigants. For example, go online and look at the Lynn County Circuit Court website and you'll find the forms that the other candidates talked about, the interactive forms where you can file a small claims case, an FED case, or even a dissolution online. 
We have a family law specialist named Heidi. She can't give you legal advice, but she can look over your hand forms, your paper forms, and determine if it's ready to be filed. The court, has, Lynn County Circuit Court, has implemented informal domestic relations trials. This means that a pro se litigant, rather than choosing a traditional trial, could choose an informal domestic relations trial where the judge asks the questions and that the rules of evidence are relaxed. For a pro se litigant who has no experience about trials or how to conduct one, this may be the appropriate process for them. Our mentally ill are the least likely to have resources to ensure due process. Lynn County Circuit Court has implemented a mental health protocol with the goal of reducing recidivism rates, They're moving seriously mentally ill individuals from the criminal system over to resources and services at Lynn County Mental Health. This decreases the drain on the county for resources, increases our community safety, and increases the mentally ill's access to services. What would I improve? Can I do it really quick, I would improve education and access to the services we currently have, in addition to video, along, um, which helps when individuals may not necessarily be able to understand or go through the forms that we currently have. Thank you. Terry, the next question. What, in your view, is the most significant problem currently facing the Lynn County Court, and how can that challenge be addressed? Well, uh, well the, the most important problem that we have is, is with our financial resources. Um, there just simply is not enough to go around. Um, and we have, as, as Judge Stetswater said earlier, as other people have, have said earlier, we have five judges on the bench. Lynn County has grown in population. Based on the size of our county, we should have a sixth judge, and we don't. Um, and there actually are processes in place right now to talk about improving our financial resources for our court system. Um, there was, like I said before, that study, there was a study that was done in 2016, and one of the things that was talked about was now that our, we had an electronic court processing system that's implemented, now one of their focuses next is to improve some of our judicial resources. And one of the things they talked about was improving our judicial staff, our, our judges, our judicial staff, and our courthouses. That's actually on there and identified in 2016 as what they're gonna be doing in this, in this next um, biennium. One of the things that they are talking about doing is uh, in some of, we need to make sure that our county people here who live in Lynn County have the same resources available that are available in other counties. Uh, for example, uh, Multnomah County is building a brand new courthouse. Lane County is slated to build a brand new courthouse. Clackamas County is slated to build a brand new courthouse. And we don't even have a sixth judge that we need. Those are things that we need desperately here in order to serve our county residents the same way that other residents are being served that live elsewhere. Rachel. So the significant problem we are facing is absolutely time. When you think about the stress of litigation and waiting until justice is being delivered, that is an incredible toll emotionally and financially for litigants. The time it takes you to get to trial can be years. I, I, sorry, I do civil commitments for the county and I'm also given one hour in order to prove that an individual is mentally ill that that mental illness causes them to be dangerous to themselves or dangerous to somebody else or that they have an inability to care for themselves and that commitment is the least restrictive. I'm given just one hour and Judge McKill who's here will tell you I often sometimes go over that one hour but that's all I'm given for that short window to prove something extremely important. And oftentimes with family law cases I'll go in ready prepared to have a, a trial and I'll be stacked three deep with other cases as well. And so how do you solve that problem? Yes, we absolutely need more judges if we can get them. But you also solve it with experience on the bench. You need to elect judges that are ready to go to work, that have diverse experience and have litigation experience. I bring with me, we, we are losing over 100 years of experience on the bench with Judge Bisflin's retirement, with Judge Murphy's retirement, and additionally key support staff that have retired. And so you need judges who can get to work and help lighten the load, and I have criminal, family law, civil commitment, and civil experience. So that's what you can do as a voter to help um, solve our significant problem. Thank you. Questions from the audience? And Terry, you want to take on this first one? 
Well, no, you can be first on the next one. Please describe how your history of in-courtroom experience qualifies you for the position you seek. Well, as I said, I have been a trial attorney for 21 years. I graduated from law school in 97. Actually, even before I graduated from law school, I was in the courtroom. I was actually one of the youngest people to ever argue a case at even the Oregon Court of Appeals when I was in law school. Um, and I was appearing in court under the student appearance rule as well. So I have a number of years in the, in the courtroom. And that, the ability to handle cases, the ability to be fair, the ability to understand what clients and what people want when they come into court, first thing they want is a judge who will listen to them. You're there in court because you have something that's important to you, that you want a person in a black robe who's a complete stranger to you to hear your case and have enough time. And this is somebody that you don't know usually. You haven't ever been in front of this person before. You want somebody who's able to listen to you. There's a reason why the bar exam has all of the issues of law. We've all been well educated in the law. But when you take the admissions test for law school, it actually has nothing to do with the bar exam. It is all about logical reasoning, analytical reasoning. You want somebody on the bench who has those skills. And those are things that are developed in the courtroom. You also want somebody on the bench who's gonna be fair, who's gonna be unbiased, who has a good judicial temperament. All of those things can't be taught. You can't learn those in law school. You can't learn those things from a book. You need to be able to have somebody on the bench who has those skills, who's able to uh, judge fairly and that you feel that when you walk in the courtroom, you can feel will be fair and just to you. Rachel, you want me to repeat the question or do you have it? Sure. Let's please describe how your history of in-courtroom experience qualifies you for the position you seek. So I'll tell you a little bit about my experience this last week to give you a glimpse. So on Friday, I was at the courthouse from 9 until 2.30. I had a family law trial scheduled. I was able to go ahead and negotiate with the other side, sitting in the hallway with my client um, for that period of time, and we resolved a dissolution case, almost ready for the judgment to be signed. So that was Friday. Monday, I worked in my office um, on some personal injury cases, and then on Today, I was in the Municipal Court of Lebanon prosecuting crimes for the city of Lebanon. And then at, at noon, I then headed over, I think it was about 12.30 by the time I got over there, I went over and appeared at Lynn County Circuit Court on a civil commitment case. And so I am moving from one area of the law to the other in my trial practice. And that's because I'm from a general practice firm. Morley Thomas is the only firm here in town and my partners and I and our associate attorneys handle an array of areas of the law, which makes me very well suited um, to, to go to the bench from Morley Thomas. And I have practiced, um, I, I'm a hard worker. That is one quality that, um, that I think when I get on the bench, if you elect me, that I promise that I will work hard and that I will listen to you if you're in my courtroom. And I have the, I have the wonderful experience of having Judge McHale as a mentor in my practice. He owned that firm. And when he um, was elected to the bench, my partners and I bought him out. And so then if I'm able to go to the bench, the ability to be mentored by him, he is the presiding judge now. He displays an array of respect to the people who enter his courtroom. Okay, this one's to you, Rachel. How can the court and judicial system help solve the opioid crisis? That's a great question. They can't do it alone. So that is a crisis we all as a community have to take part in. So whether it is, um, it's the court working with parole and probation, with, um, with treatment, drug and alcohol, Lynn County drug and alcohol treatment, it's worth the Lynn County jail. It's working together to use those resources to create a smarter justice system so that we know what resources we have available and how to make decisions. We, a judge relies a lot on the defense and the prosecution to come up with some problem solving techniques for the individuals that come before the court. So oftentimes you'll hear a judge taking a plea offer based on the information that um, the DA and the defense attorney um, has at the time. Sometimes it's the defense attorney that knows best what their client needs. And so um, providing that opportunity um, to get defendants into treatment when they're willing to go to treatment. 
And so we as a community need to work with both the hospital and providing opportunity for individuals facing that crisis. And I tell you, as a prosecutor, sometimes when I'm writing an offer, I'm wondering how long do I have to put this young person in jail just to get them free from drug use so maybe they would come out clean. And maybe that means you know, them being in Lynn County Jail for a period of time to get them off the street and their brain clean from drugs. But it's a, it's a problem that we face um, with our children growing up and us as parents and being in this community and business owners that um, I know the hospital, um, Samaritan, has taken efforts as well um, to help with this problem. Terry, you need that repeated? One thing that we do need to consider is that our opioid, crisis, our opioid crisis is not just a drug problem, it's also a mental health problem as well. Um, many of you may not realize that recently, uh, Lynn County Mental Health Program cut almost 20 staff members. Uh, that poses a significant problem to the mental health community. Uh, our drug problem that we have is lots of times t tied with mental, mental health problems as well. Uh, when you have people with addiction issues, lots of times you have depression issues, some other mental health program problem that goes right along with it. Uh, we do have a wonderful drug court. Right now, Judge McHill is administering that and doing absolutely wonderful with it. Uh, what some other counties are doing is a dual court program, where it's not just a drug treatment program, but also a mental health treatment program, so that those cases that are identified, identified where somebody needs mental health treatment, that can be dealt with it as well, and those cases may be served and maybe take a little bit more extra special time if it's necessary. Um, one thing as well is that we also need to think about whether we need to do what's called medically assisted treatment as well. Uh, that way when somebody is incarcerated, uh, they may be going through withdrawal, you may need to deal with uh, medically assisted treatment or some sort of a treatment program while somebody is actually incarcerated. It doesn't work very well when somebody is only offered treatment after they're convicted of a case. Sometimes that may be nine months, it may be a year, it may be two years. Well, that's quite a long time before somebody actually finally gets into treatment. Now you each have 60 seconds to wrap up. Rachel. All right. I want to thank you. Um, as I sit up here, this is sort of a bittersweet endeavor for me. I will tell you that I have been blessed by this community. I've been Woman of the Year for Lebanon, Citizen of the Year for Sweet Home, LBCC's Distinguished Alumni. I would not be a lawyer have it, had it not been for this community rallying around me and helping me to get there. As I look at the Morley Thomas Law Firm staff that are here and my partners, I'm in the best place that I could be professionally. I could not um, find a better place to work or be around better people. And so when the opportunity arose in this situation where there was a need to fill the uh, uh, judge on the bench, it was with heartfelt interest that I raised my hand, not because I want to go anywhere else from where I'm at, but in honor to serve this community for what you've done for me. I'm in debt to you. I'm absolutely in debt to you. And so I raise my hand, willing to serve and continue to give to this community for what you've given to me. And so um, if, if I do get elected, I'm telling you, I've got the best partners in the world and the best staff that are here. And when you see us campaigning, I want to thank my husband. <laughs> well, thank you to, oh, you haven't made your final statement. Nope, I haven't. <laughs> Since the last person here to speak tonight, so I do want to thank all of you for, a, for coming to this event tonight, um, and as well as the Lebanon Chamber for putting it on, and for all the candidates for appearing, not just for the judicial, judicial race. Um, I do want to be your next Lynn County Circuit Court judge. I think all of us who've put our name in for this have this uh, goal, of this ideal of servitude to our community, um, and mine as well. Um, I was born and raised here, like I said, in Lynn County. I put my name in for judge because I want to help our, com our courthouse. I want to help our community be a better place to live. I live here as well. I've lived here for many years. My family's been here. I raised my children here. And I want to ensure that our, our community is safe, that we have an efficient courtroom, that we're able to serve our community, and that we're able to continue 
uh, the tradition that's been on the bench for many years in our community as well and uh, uphold the standards that we've had. Uh, again, I do want to thank you for coming and uh, hope that you will consider voting for me uh, when it comes time for the ballots to come out. Thank you to all the candidates and the chamber and the, what's the committee that, that organizes this political action? Okay. And Anita, thanks for stepping up and doing the timing. Um, we are done, but I think most of the candidates are staying. Uh, so if you've got more questions, uh, uh, buttonhole them. Thank you very much for coming. It was a good audience. Appreciate your participation.